Oh. Okay. So we're recording. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Schrager. Dr. Louis Schrager, because there are two Dr. Schragers here. Um, Dr. Gloria Schrager is here as, also as well. Um, Koha Kavod. Um, so may Hashem bless all of you and your families with good health. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Louis Schrager. I've been calling him Luke for my entire life. We agreed as to the last procession uh, that I'll call him Luke for, uh, well, call him Luke for this. Um, let's see. So Luke's grandmother, my dad's grandmother were sisters. Luke is a world famous vaccine researcher. Um, he's also a super cool mensch who happens to be a playwright and an author, a great photographer and a descendant of the Sasova Rebbe, as are several other people here. Um, I think if I know right, pretty, there's all the Schragers, correct? We're I think so. Okay. okay. Um, I'd also like to thank Chaim Massoff, um, who requested this session. That's how this all got um, spurred on. Um, and uh, so Yashka Chaim, you're the man, always looking out for everybody like a true Gabbai. Um, so my role here is just to host this session, session and, you know, just try to stay out of the way as much as possible. Um, I'm going to, at the end of this little intro, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, you can, you could still unmute yourselves. Um, if there's background noise, I'll just, um, I'll just, uh, what's it called? And don't mind if I distract it's because I'm, I'm not like, you know, doing other things as people come into the room. Um, so um, I'll like, you know, I could, I just remute people if I hear, you know, I'll mute everybody if I hear background noise or whatever. Um, and then you, if you want to ask a question, you can un unmute yourself. Um, the, you know, the easiest way to unmute yourself, you can, once you're muted, you could just pull the space bar down and then talk while, while the space bar is down. That's a, a neat little trick, or you can, you know, click the unmute. Um, uh, we'll start with questions that were asked in advance. Um, we got, uh, there's 15 questions that were sent in advance. Um, so do you want to start, start with the wait, Zala, Do you want to start with the the slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna have the slides. We're gonna have this. We're gonna have ten slides. We're gonna have a ten, about a ten minute slide presentation first, um, and then we're gonna go to the questions that we asked first at, at, ahead of time, and then we are going to go to the floor, so to speak. Uh, for the floor, you could ask them in you know chat. You could raise your hand, uh, like there's a raise your hand feature. People are still entering, by the way. Um, there's a raise your hand feature. So I think we were right with the call on uh, what's it called, Mincha. Um, there's a raise your hand feature. You could, you know, just go call out whatever. Um, and do, 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 do. Okay. I uh, record, um, this is being recorded. If you get booted off of Wi-Fi or, you know, anything like that, you know, you can rejoin with the original link. Um, and, uh, you, you I'm on two computers, so I should see it pop up. Um, I'll, I'll keep checking to see. Um, and that's basically it. Um, uh, okay, so we're going to start off with a 10 minute um, PowerPoint presentation Luke, that Lou put together to explain the COVID-19 life cycle and also explains how antibodies, I'm not even going to get into the explainings of what explains because Luke will explain it better than me. So without further ado, thank you so much, Luke. You are the man. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Zalman, and thank you everyone for, um, for joining. Um, yeah. So this is the second session I've done with, with your communities and it's, it's a pleasure to be back. The season's very different. I'm sitting out here on a, a porch in Bethesda, Maryland. It's very lovely out here. Um, I wanna emphasize that this night is really for you. Um, I, I thought I'd start with, a, as Alman mentioned, a very brief uh, slide presentation just to illustrate some things you might have not seen before really just because I thought you might be interested in it. It might help help you conceptualize what this virus is and what the vaccines are and particularly the mRNA vaccines are, uh, how they work. Uh, I threw in a couple extra slides on the variants as well because I thought there'd be questions about it. But most importantly, um, ask questions. Uh, we, we have a list of 15, Zalman, uh, is going to go through them. <laughs> We're going to do a tag team. Um, I will answer them to the best of my ability. Um, don't hesitate to ask any question. There are no stupid questions. There are questions I may not be able to answer, and I will tell you I won't be able to answer. I can give you some thoughts on it. 
Um, but uh, anyway, uh, that that to me is the most important thing is the, is the Q and A and trying to address your your you know curiosities and questions. So Zalman, why don't we go ahead and jump into the presentation? Okay. Zalman's going to run this. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So this is just a very brief overview of um, the, the so, uh, vaccines for the virus that we call SARS-CoV-2. Um, you can see that it is a direct re relative of the SARS virus that uh, you know we we dealt with a number of years ago. Um, so if you go to the second slide, I, I used to use this slide in the courses I taught at Hopkins on vaccine development. It looks very complicated, um, but it's actually a, a very nice sim uh, uh, summary of, in, of, of how a vaccine works. It's from a Scientific American in 2009. Um, and the point is not to uh, go into the details here. I think that the overall point is that it's complicated. The immune response is complicated. And what vaccines do is to, to allow the immune system to see pieces of potential pathogens in ways that don't cause disease, but basically trick the immune response into thinking that the pathogen is there, thereby developing a, an immune response a memory of that pathogen so that when the pathogen, if one comes in contact with that pathogen, you have an ability preloaded in your immune response to combat it before it causes disease. So I'm just gonna walk you through this very quickly. In this case, that little syringe on the left-hand side is injecting in this case a it's, it's, it's kind of a different kind of vaccine that we're using for COVID, but it's, it's sort of the old, the old fashioned vaccines that are still very prevalent, um, the most widely used vaccines. And this could be a, a live virus that's been weakened. This could be a killed virus. Um, but the, the, that live or killed viral entity, and this, this is really focusing on a viral vaccine now, is injected into a cell into your muscles um, where it comes in contact with these cells with these little fingers sticking out called dendritic cells and they're called dendritic cells because they're dendrites. And I think the couple messages here is that the dendritic cells take up the virus. You see this one that's inside this little cell here. It's going inside, but then it gets chewed up into its pieces. So when your immune system actually sees um, um, a pathogen, it doesn't see the whole pathogen, whether it's a real pathogen that's infecting or whether it's a, a, from a vaccine. Your immune system, the dendritic cell, chews it up and then basically presents it on the tips of these little dendritic fingers to these components of the immune response. Um, the key one is the T cell. Um, and then the T cells, you've heard of T helper cells or CD4 positive T cells. Those are the cells actually of HIV attacks, which is why the immune system is so dev devastated by HIV. Those CD4 positive T cells or T helper cells are the orchestra of the immunological, uh, the conductor of the immunological orchestra. They take those antigens and they present them to other arms of the immune system. In this case, for COVID, I'm gonna focus on B cells because B cells create antibody. Um, and that's in general how vaccines work. Next slide, please. So in the vaccine world, we talk about vaccine platforms. It's just a kind of a different way of saying different strategies to allow your immune system to see Pathogens uh, and prepare, but that are not um, that are not that won't cause disease. It's either pathogens or pieces of pathogens. Um, so, what working from left to right ac across this, these are the candidates that were considered for 
making a vaccine against the particular coronavirus. Um, on the left, you see just virus itself. That's what we reflected in the, slide, in the slide previously. That's, again, the old classic way, either create a weakened form of the virus or a killed form of the virus. I can tell you that is not, the, neither of those uh, platforms, exactly, thank you, uh, Zalman, are, um, neither of those platforms are key, um, are being used in any important way in, uh, in, in this particular, um, uh, against this particular virus. Why don't you skip over nucleic acid and go to viral vector, all right? Um, the viral vectored vaccines are, uh, what a viral vectored vaccine means is that you take a, a virus that is um, not pathogenic for humans or manipulated in a way to make it not pathogenic. So the Johnson & Johnson a vaccine, for example, is an adenovirus. It's a common cold virus. It's, I think, AD26. And what the, the manufacturers do is that inside the um, genome yeah. of the adenovirus, they put a little piece of the coronavirus that expresses the protein against yeah. which you want an immune response to be raised. And we're going to go into that in just a second. So the idea is that these viruses are injected in you. They go through a few a few bouts of reputation, of not of 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 um, not rep, of uh, they make copies of themselves. Sorry, and um, and express that protein from the coronavirus, uh, and that's enough to trigger an immune response against the coronavirus. Um, the protein, so, so Johnson & Johnson has that. The other uh, one is um, the uh, AstraZeneca is a viral vectored vaccine. Um, AstraZeneca, interestingly, is using a, an adenovirus derived from chimpanzees, not from, not from humans. There's reasons for that, but we won't go into that unless anyone wants to know in the Q&A. The protein-based vaccines um, are, uh, off are, are, have been cutting edge and very effective. And um, here you're basically just giving directly the protein against the protein from the coronavirus against which you want an immune response to be raised. The, and, and, and then there, there's a necessity often to, to boost the immune response of a protein based vaccine with what's something called an adjuvant. So it's a protein adjuvant vaccine. And the, the, the company doing that is Novavax, and they they very shortly uh, will receive, I'm sure, um, an emergency use authorization for that vaccine. Now let's hop back to nucleic acid. This has really been in center stage, and these are the mRNA vaccines. Um, so you have the uh, Moderna mRNA and the Pfizer BioNTech mRNA. Uh, nucleic acid vaccines also include DNA vaccines, but they've been very disappointing and there's not worth, it's not worth talking about them. We're going to go specifically into the mechanism of action of the mRNA vaccines. I have a slide on that in just a minute. So let's skip uh, to the next slide. So just a couple of slides really quickly to emphasize how effective vaccines are. Um, this is an, an oldish slide from uh, 2006, but it's still really useful to, to give you a sense of how incredibly um, useful, what an incredible tool vaccines uh, are uh, to, to public health. Um, smallpox has been uh, eradicated. Uh, diphtheria in this country is eradicated. You know, measles, uh, measles, mumps, pertussis, all these, all these, all these, all um, these uh, 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 terrible uh, diseases have been suppressed, if not um, eliminated in this country uh, as a result of vaccines. And the next slide, um, if, if you could go to the next slide, we'll show you that in fact, not only do, do vaccines work, but they work really fast. So once you start using them, um, you can see what happened when the, in the left 
uh, graph, what happened when the measles vaccine was licensed and um, you know, you get a, a very rapid decline to near zero of measles incidence following the introduction of measles vaccination. And then on the right side, you see a similar situation with rotavirus, which is a bad virus of uh, the GI tract in, in, in children, killed, kill, kills a lot of children worldwide. And this is from Mexico and you can see this seasonal spike in rotavirus. They introduce the vaccine and suddenly those spikes are suppressed and, and you know, all but go away. So next slide, please. So this is um, what's been torturing us for the last year. This is a schematic of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, what I wanna bring particular attention to are these red things sticking out the top with the little dots on them. Um, and those are the spike proteins. And that's where all the action is immunologically. Um, it's against those spike proteins uh, that immune responses have to be raised to uh, inhibit the ability of the coronavirus to go through its life cycle, a life cycle that induces disease in people who are infected. What I'm gonna do in the next couple of slides is to show you how, how incredibly elegant some of the work is that, that went into this and that these nice kind of relatively smooth, you know, you see these kind of little blobs on top. When you actually get, you know, kind of take a deeper dive, I hope I'll impress you because I'm impressed with how complex this is. So, so the next slide, please. Um, so this is the replication cycle. Maybe, Zalman, if you could blow that up a tad. I saw you do that before and that's really useful. That's great, you can stop it there. All right, so the, um, the, the box is a cell, uh, okay, the gray box. Um, the virus on top, top left is you can see binding to the cell with the spike protein interacting to its specific receptor. We won't go into what that receptor is. Um, but the idea is that that spike protein needs to interact with a specific re receptor on specific cells. And these are cells in the mainly on your, in your respiratory epithelium um, that lead into your lead down uh, your 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 trachea, your bronchi into your lungs, which is why this is a lung disease primarily, not solely, by the way. Um, so anyway, it gets into your respiratory epithelial cell. It opens it up. It spills its genetic material. The genetic material is um, trans uh, transcribed, translated into many more copies of the various proteins that make uh, the, the new, uh, vir new young virions. Um, they get assembled in the cellular, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cellular machine that, that deals with protein processing and whatnot. And then it all they all come together um, uh, resulting in new variants that then re are released from the cell. And in the process, these, these epithelial cells that are infected uh, become damaged and, and die. Um, and that's what causes disease because with, when you start to lose your respiratory epithelium, particularly deeper into the lungs, these, uh, the, these, these epithelial cells are very tight bound to each other and they prevent the leaking of the liquid in your blood, the, the serum and whatnot into your alveolar spaces. Um, when they're damaged, you do get leaking and you're, you basically fill up with proteinaceous gunk, sloughed cells, proteinaceous thick serum and whatnot in your lung. And, and that's pneumonia and, and, and that's what can damage and, and even kill you. Um, next slide. So how does in prim primarily antibodies uh, uh, affect uh, the ability to, or you know, inhibit the ability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus 
from binding to these cells, these res respiratory epithelial cells. So we're just gonna deal with the left. We're not gonna deal with the stuff on the right. That, that's a little bit <laughs> for another day. Um, the, the idea here is it's, it's basically steric inhibition. You got an antibody that wraps around the, pro, the spike protein and basically blocks the ability of that spike protein to interact with the receptor. It's pretty straightforward. It's like if you were gonna, if, if you analogize this to a, a key fitting into a lock, you know, what an antibody is, is a piece of gum that you stick on the key and you can't get it in the lock. And if you can't get in the lock, the virus stays out of the cell and basically gets eliminated. Next slide. All right. So I said, it's not as simple as you think. And, and, and so this is a deeper dive using a technique called X-ray crystallography of what these spike proteins actually look like. And they're, they're different protein bands that are all wrapped around each other. And you'd say, well, okay, fine, you know, cover them all and you'll be fine. That's not how it works. You actually cover only a small portion of this glop that is your spike protein. What portion do you cover to block that lock and key interaction? Well, that's what scientists work years and years and years to define those particular areas where the protein interacts with that receptor um, that are blockable by an immune response are called epitopes. And in this particular X-ray crystallog crystallographic illustration, these little blue kind of grape clusters are potential epitopes for blocking the question then becomes which one or couple do you want to block through a vaccine to affect protection? I'll say that a, my former chief resident at Vanderbilt, a guy named Barney Graham, became the vaccine, the, the clinical director of the Vaccine Research Center. And he spent 10, 15 years working out just this kind of issue, not anticip or anticipating, but not knowing that the next big pandemic would be due to uh, a coronavirus. And it's lucky he spent those 10 or so years because when this SARS-CoV-2 came down the pike, he already knew where to develop those antibodies and sent that information to the drug companies, to the, to the biotechs to develop those vaccines. So we can go to the next slide and I'll show you that it's, this is how complicated it is. So this is a close up of what I just showed you. And those little colored molecules are different epitopes. And you can see they're only, you know, very small pieces within that larger, you know, spaghetti glop. And it takes a lot of work to figure out which of those epitopes are necessary to be in a vaccine. That was work that went on before this pandemic. And we were very fortunate that it happened because we didn't have to wait, we knew. Next, next, uh, all right. So let's go to mRNA vaccines. How do they work? Um, can you make them a little bit, make this guy a little bigger? Ah, there we go. All right, so what happens is that the researchers, in this case, you know, what I just showed you, learn what the, key aspects of that spike protein are that um, interact with the cells. When you see that piece of protein, you can then back translate and figure out what the nucleic acid um, sequences are. And you build those in the lab and you make to so the DNA, you find out what the DNA code for that protein would be. And then that it gets copied into messenger RNA. And messenger RNA is when you have transcription, the DNA, well, you know, DNA ends up into RNA, and then messenger RNA goes to ribosomes. Ribosomes then um, create the protein that is coded for by this messenger RNA. When you're making an mRNA vaccine, 
you have this segment of mRNA in number two, and then it's encapsulated in number three in a lipid nanoparticle, a nanoparticle of specifically constructed fat. And that is really important because mRNA gets degraded very rapidly in the body. This was the really the, the brilliant breakthrough that allowed for the development of mRNA, the, the uh, figuring out how to protect that mRNA vaccine in a way, how to protect the mRNA in a way that allowed it to be injected into the body without being degraded before that mRNA was expressed. So you have number three, that is the vaccine the mRNA encapsulated lip lipid nanoparticle, you're looking at a schematic of what the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is, of what the Moderna is. The only real difference between, they're using the same sequence of mRNA, basically presented to them by the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH. What, what, um, what's different about these vaccines, one of the things that's different is what kind of solution fat lipid you know, uh, 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 molecule they, they came up with in their particular formulations. So anyway, that, that's your vaccine. And number four, it's, va it, it's injected into your arm. Hopefully every, everybody's got this vaccine. If not, we'll talk about it. The lipid is, allows the mRNA to go into the cytoplasm of a muscle cell that mRNA goes through ribosomes and the protein for which the mRNA um, is built, is, it, it codes for, becomes expressed. Now notice in here, you're not getting the entire virion. You're only getting this, the spike protein, really just a piece of the spike protein. Those spike proteins go out on the top of the cell. They interact with your cellular system, just like I showed you back in the beginning, how a vaccine works, and you end up with antibodies um, to that particular spike protein that now is available. Should you become infected, you have memory and memory B cells that can, uh, you, number one, you develop antibody, but you also develop memory that should be able, hopefully, to protect you down the road. So that's how these mRNA vaccines work. Notice one thing really importantly, there are some people who are saying that mRNA will change your DNA, blah, blah, blah. The mRNA has nothing to do with DNA, okay, number one. And number two, if you, you see that all the action here is happening in the cytoplasm. That little circle beneath those little squiggles there, you see if you yeah, move it down there, that's your nucleus. Nothing's happening in the nucleus. That's where your DNA is. So it's total baloney when people say, well, the mRNA can somehow affect your, your genetics. Okay, next slide. All right, so where are we? Um, so we have um, two mRNA vaccines, one from Pester and BioNTech and from Moderna. They've been approved for US, uh, use in the US uh, by the FDA under something called emergency use authorization. Notice that they are not licensed. Uh, that will come down the pike but they're being used under emergency use authorization. We have a viral vector platform, the ADD26, Johnson & Johnson. Um, and then we have you know, the AstraZeneca, which is the chimp adeno, um, not being used here. And Novavax is adjuvanted protein, which soon will be used here. Next slide, please. So just a word on variants. I don't want to belabor this, um, but what variants are, if you can see that, if you, if you look at the, 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 the third column in this little blue-gray box, yeah, they're just mutations in the gene that codes for the S protein. And so if you go back and you remember that deepest dive I, I showed you with all those you know, small colored molecules among all the yellow wiggles, these mutations can alter just slightly or more than slightly those particular epitopes, thereby making the vaccines potentially less efficient at binding, at creating antibodies that bind to those epitopes. However, that's relative. 
because understand that these mRNA vaccines are astoundingly 95% efficacious at preventing um, uh, COVID disease. And so even a small amount of decrease still results in effective vaccines against these variants. Next slide, please. So final points about the variants. Uh, my only kind of speaking slide is that yes, vigilance is required, but there's no need to panic. As I mentioned, these mutations may lead to reduced efficacy of COVID vaccines, but the current vaccines are extraordinarily efficacious, as I just mentioned, um, and against even mildly symptomatic disease. The current vaccines are ne nearly 100% efficacious at preventing serious disease or death. Um, so that even if you, even if you have variants that results in a degree of redu reduction in vaccine efficacy, the likelihood is that the vaccines are still gonna be good enough to lead us to a herd immunity and end the spread of this virus through the population. The key is it needs, these vaccines need to be uh, uh, taken up uh, widely enough. The actual impact on the, vac on the efficacy of the vaccines more, and disease morbidity and, uh, and mortality uh, must be studied. Uh, the good news is an Israeli study showed that the BioNTech vaccine was 95%, 97% effective when the British variant was the dominant strain in Israel. So that's even a higher degree of efficacy that they showed from the clinical trial. And there are in vitro studies that also suggest that you're gonna get pretty good neutralization against the uh, British, Brazilian and South African strains. I think that's it, right? Yes. Okay, why don't we turn off the slides? and we can address questions um, for you. All right, um, here we go. Now, do we want, do you think we want to like let 30 seconds and see if anybody has any quick questions off after the slides or yes. like see? Okay. I think that's a great idea. So I'm, I'm shutting up for 30 seconds. I see one, one chat here. Um, yeah, that was before. That, that was, was before, yeah. yeah. Well, if not, we can just go straight to the question. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah. second. oh go ahead, go ahead. Um, how does the uh, 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 copy of the spike protein, the little, little bit of the spike protein get out of the cell? How do you encapsulate it so that it can get, make it with the, the uh, lipid of the cell membrane? Is, so you're talking about after the spike is made by the mRNA vaccine? Yes. It just yes. happens. I mean, these, these things naturally just kind of are presented. They, they, they move to the surface. There are things attached to them. But don't, don't, don't they need a lipid to help get out of a lipid membrane of the cell? No, they, they actually are able to, um, to, to be expressed on the, on the, member, on the, on the surface of, uh, on the surface of the cell. I mean, that's the brilliance of it. They, it acts as if it's, it's the actual virus. You know how the virus, when the virus is formed inside the cell and then it buds out, same thing happens with the spike proteins. They just kind of rise to the surface and then kind of glob through and stick mm -hmm. out into your, into your external world. Exactly what the mechanism of that is, I, I don't know, but it happens. Let's go. Can we get copies of your slides? Um, I don't see why not. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I, I took some of this stuff off the web. Um, so some of it may be proprietary. I don't know. I'm using this for teaching purposes. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Um, Luke, I know Dr. Strackler. So if you want, I can email them person by person as they request them. That's um, fine. rather than posting it on YouTube, like, does that work? Yeah, I, I wouldn't want them posted on social yeah. media and stuff like that, just because I don't want to get myself in trouble. Okay. Thank you, Zoe. Sure. Yep, no problem. I think I heard somebody else asking a question. I might be wrong. And by the way, we already have a, this has been terrific and easy to comprehend. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's go with the questions. Um, and, and, um, 
if you have questions at any point or, you know, even from the thing, again, you can put, put them in chat. I'm going to, I'm going to be checking that. Um, and, uh, or again, interject at any point. Um, ready? Okay. Um, is going to host hotels safe? How about Airbnb, cruises, airplanes? Okay. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't, I don't, I don't like to think about things as safe versus unsafe. I, I, I mentioned this during our last talk. I, I like to think of things on a scale of risk. Um, and, and, in, and now you can separate that into vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people. Um, let's just deal with the unvaccinated first. I think the question probably is more focused on now that you're vaccinated, but let's just say from the unvaccinated, um, you are still putting yourself at risk. Um, if you put your, you know, this, as the CDC came out and finally said today, um, this basically is an indoor virus. Um, you know, if you're outdoors, it's, it, it's, it's even without a mask, unless you're in crowded conditions, like in a stadium or, you know, a, protest or whatever, it's, it's unlikely you're going to get infected outside. Um, but inside, um, you will be putting yourself at risk um, unless you wear a mask. Uh, with a mask and with other people masked then, uh, or vaccinated, then that risk is going to go down. Um, so until, if you're, un, if you're unvaccinated, which Again, I, I really hope no one is. I mean, if you have an opportunity to get vaccinated, you really should. Um, but if, if you do, for whatever reason, remain unvaccinated, you will remain at risk um, until the incidence of disease in the population you exist in basically pretty much goes away, you know? And that should happen after a while, you know, if, after we do attain a degree of herd immunity and there's no place else for the virus to go and it will peter out. It's going to happen if we can get people vaccinated. Um, if you're vaccinated, everything you do suddenly becomes much less risky, everything, okay? It's like wearing, you know, basically, I. I rightly or wrongly, the way I think about it, it's like wearing a 95%, you know, an, an N95 mask in a, in a way, even though the, to, to prevent particles from escaping con conceptually with the mask, not particles get in, but you know, it's, it's like you have, you have around, you have 95% efficacy from a vaccine. And so, then the question is, where would you, um, might there be a situation where you still would want to be careful? So like in hotels, I mean, I, I had gone to hotels on a need to do, not nice to do, um, uh, uh, situ you know, conception, perspective, even when I was not vaccinated. I wear a mask in the elevator, I'm, but you know, when I'm in a room, I take my mask off and I'm okay. Now, being going to hotels is much less risky. Um, going on airplanes, I actually have not flown since the beginning of the pandemic because I didn't need to. Uh, like I said, I divided things, the world into need to do versus nice to do, and I didn't need to fly. So I didn't fly. Would I fly now? Yes, I would. Um, would I wear a mask inside a plane? Yes, you would. And th my personal answer is yes, I would. Um, even though I'm vaccinated, because it does provide an extra layer of protection. I wouldn't be surprised if wearing masks inside planes becomes the new normal. Um, I know every time I fly to Israel, I, three days later, I'm sick with a fever in a respiratory, and I know I got up from the plane. Um, so, 
you know, it's not a bad idea. You know, and Asian cultures have been doing it for, for years now. And uh, uh, I'm going to think about doing that. That's just me, though. So would, would I go on a cruise? Um, I've never been on a cruise. Uh, full disclosure, I never planned to be on a cruise. <laughs> it's not my thing. Um, th what I think would make cruises more risky is that it's the duration of potential indoor exposure. So, you know, on a plane, you fly, you know, maybe it's three hours, maybe it's five hours, you fly to Tel Aviv, it's, it's 11 hours, um, then you're done. In a cruise, you have constant exposure in the dining rooms, inside. Will it be okay? Probably but it increases the chance that you want. So I guess what I'm saying is it becomes almost an individual, an individual uh, 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 decision. How much risk are you willing to tolerate based on what you want to achieve out of that particular uh, behavior? So I don't know if that, you know, again, there's no, there's no, you're safe, you're not safe, do this, don't do that. You got to weigh. Uh, I think what, what the vaccine does do is allow people now to do the nice to do things again. And, and, and that's, that means we're coming out of this. You know, we can do nice to do things as long as we're smart about it. Cool. <clears throat> awesome. Um, all right. Uh, this comes from actually someone who was uh, in the last session too. And um, all right. So what, what if someone has a situation where their family got it, but got COVID, um, but not all the family, should they get vaccinated? Yes. Okay. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they, everyone, yes, they should be vaccinated. Okay. Um, when I have, there's a question in the chat. I think I'm going to do these next three questions, then go to the chat. What level, because this is a big one right here, what level of herd immunity do we need to reach in order to get back to normal? Yeah, that's a great question. And all I can do is quote the experts because that's a complicated, um, that's a complicated question that depends on underlying assumptions of transmissibility and degree of protection, variants, you know, how much. So Tony Fauci uh, the other day quoted, uh, the, gave a range of 70 to 85%. Tony's not an epidemiologist, so he was getting that from somewhere, um, probably somebody at the CDC. And I am more than happy to, um, to refer to Dr. Fauci's uh, uh, suggestion of that range. I, I can't add to that. Okay. Um, this is for me. Um, is, so how safe is going back to school and in what form and what would you recommend in terms of like is it, it's like, is it silly to promote it before the kids are vaccinated, before the kids are allowed to get vaccinated? Yeah, this is a really tough question. Um, I, th this may, thank you, Zalman, for asking the hardest question. On the <laughs> no, because again, you know, is it safe? Is it not? <sighs> It's not a nice to do, it's a need to do. You need to get kids back to school. Sure. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, one of the things I've been saying, and I think I said it on the last call, is that I try, I've actually succeeded, I think, in, 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 in not fearing this virus, but respecting it. And we do not know yet the full scope of the pathophysiology of this virus. We don't fully understand it. Um, it, you know, it mainly goes to lung. It can affect other organs, including the brain. It can cause these micro clots. And I'm not talking about the vaccine associated stuff with J and J. Um, and I mean, optimally, I'd like to see me, okay, this is, this may be different than what the CDC is. And I'm not that particularly conservative. Like I said, I've been doing stuff. I've been shopping with masks on. I never washed a bag, you know, I never did any of that stuff. Would I send my kid to school right now? If, 
you know, without masks. I mean, depending on how old, are they going to have social distancing? What's the, you know, from the from the kids' perspective. I'm not talking about the teachers' perspective. Okay, that's different because you can be vaccinated. You know, Pfizer just gave the data that it's fine, safe for 12, you know, uh, right, 12 to 16, I think, yeah. And, um, and I know that Moderna is studying at six, six months, you know, they have a phase three, so, so data is going to be coming out. These vaccines are likely to be very safe in these kids, and they're likely to be at least as effective in kids as they are in adults, if not even more so. Considering we're now at the end of April, you've got one more month, basically a month and a half. I would be more comfortable if it were my kids. This is just me though. I would be more comfortable saying, look it, you've been out of school for X amount of time. You'll stay out of school for the next six weeks. You'll get vaccinated over the summer. Come the fall, boom, we're back in business. Okay, that's me. Um, there may be other parents who feel differently. And, and I respect that. Uh, they, you know, kids don't, you know, they don't manifest obviously diseases as, as, as seriously or frequently as, as, as adults. And um, so that, that's probably, so the other, the other component, I guess, is also what I said before, and that is what is the, what is the incidence of disease in your community? If, if you know that COVID is really on the ropes and, and it's plummeting and you're not considered high risk anymore and you, know, you haven't, then it becomes more and more acceptable, more and more, or less and less risky. I shouldn't say acceptable. It's acceptable to send your kids if you wanna do it. If the school board says you can, and this, you know, everyone says then it's okay. But, um, it becomes less risky if you have less disease in the population from where the kids are coming from. Um, I, I, I would just, I, th I would be more comfortable just waiting till fall and starting them. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, this one, and then we'll get the one from the chat. Um, you originally said that the, that those that had the virus don't need to get the vaccine. Do you still feel the same way? Yeah, this was a real eye opener for me. So I was wrong, um, <laughs> you know. No, and 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 I think and I think it's it's important because it's important to say that because I was you know in classical infectious disease when you get infected with something you don't need the vaccine, and I was kind of surprised uh, that the CDC recommended and the FDA. I guess the CDC um, recommended that people who had been infected actually get get the vaccine. Um, and uh, you know, um, and that's fine. One of the interesting questions, though, you know, I've been I've been volunteering as a vaccinator here in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I had an interesting um, event the other day, actually, with a with a, a police officer really nice guy. And I, you know, we go through a series of questions. Have you had COVID before? Yeah. And he says, yeah, I had it. And I was sick for a week. And this is back in October. And he was coming in for a second vaccine. And I said, oh, well, you know, I just kind of tossed out. Um, he had, you know, it was Moderna. And I said, so what happened after your first vaccine? He said, I, I felt almost as sick as I felt after having the real, the, the, the real infection. I, I couldn't get out of bed for a week. I had fevers, I had shaking chills. I felt horrible. And he said, and I'm really afraid of getting the second vaccine. And I, I made a decision there um, not to give him that second vaccine uh, because I rationalized that, the, you know, the second dose of the vaccine, that in fact, his reaction to the first vaccination was similar, although more intense than many persons' reactions to the second vaccination, including myself and my wife. I and mean, we, were, we were feeling pretty lousy for a day or two 
after getting the second Moderna shot. And that was just your immune system saying, hey, you know what, I'm engaged here. I've seen this thing before, and now I'm gonna really crank it up. Well, him being sick for a week after his first vaccination told me that his immune system was saying, oh man, we've seen this puppy before and um, we're all over it. And I didn't wanna give him a second vaccination. Uh, so I didn't. So it's gonna be, you know, I, I, there's, and there's no guidelines uh, to that, that I know of. You know, people say, oh, you should get two shots, but maybe they shouldn't. Um, and, and my way of dealing, it, dealing with that question as an infectious disease person is to say, I'm just gonna see how they responded to that first vaccination you know, people who had had COVID and, and if they respond as if they're responding, you know, that they already have antigen on board or immune response, on, not antigen, but immune response on board, um, then, then they don't need that second vaccination. Okay. This one's from chat. Um, we are both vaccinated and, ha and have young kids. Uh, right, we, we, and have young kids. One is breastfeeding, so we hope she has some antibodies at least. What would you recommend we do? Can we start going to indoor Shabbat meals with other kids there? Um, I, you know, probably sure. Uh, if if you're if you are in, you know, you know the people you're going to. It's not like a school room where you have thirty kids or twenty kids in a room. You don't really know all of them. You have your friends. You know, you talk to them. Are they vaccinated? What's this? Thing? How are they behaving? You know, if they've gone through the whole pandemic without being infected, now they're vaccinated, their kids are okay. Sure, go have Shabbat dinner, absolutely. Okay. Um, what do you feel about young mothers, young children taking the vaccine without knowing the long-term effects? Young mothers and young children. Um, so understand that for any vaccine, I mean, I worked for seven years in the in the office of vaccines at the FDA, and uh, you know, one of our dirty little secrets is that we only know the duration of the safety and efficacy based on the length of the phase three trial. Um, we do ask that we have there are nationwide surveillance systems to track safety, um, uh, you know, bad reactions, etc. After the vaccines have been licensed. But, um, you know, and sometimes you get surprises. In general, I mean, the, these mRNA vaccines have been so incredibly safe that based on what the, you know, again, risk benefit, right? The idea that there may be some long-term complications that we don't know, you know, is, is very theoretical. I understand that. It's not nothing wrong with being theoretical, but you got to weigh that against the real. And the real is that for young women and children, COVID can have serious consequences. That's real. That's not hypothetical. It may be less so than other adults, particularly older adults, or people with, you know, pre-existing conditions, but you know, kids get sick, kids die, young lady, young women die of, of COVID. So, you know, I don't, I don't think you, you really focus on long-term hypotheticals when we have such good evidence existing until now, and it just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger on how safe these vaccines are and how efficacious these vaccines are. I wouldn't hesitate vaccinating. Okay. Um, and I think, that, I, think, I think this was my question too, but I'm seeing answers even today. Like you said, like, um, but I'll ask it anyway. When and how do they test on kids? And what is the lowest age that will be safe or necessary for to, for, to get vaccinated? Yeah, so now you're just getting into how, you know, biotech, pharma, engage in, in trials, um, you know, that the FDA would require to allow them to allow the FDA to give the green light for use in, in certain age populations. 
uh, the FDA will not do that, will, will not green light a, the use of a, an intervention like a vaccine unless there's data in the age group. So as I, usually you start with a phase three trial in, in, in adults, you know, 18, usually 18 and over. I think Pfizer may have been 16 and over, um, which was why there's a bit of a difference, I think, in the, in the emergency use language. One is approved for 16, one is approved for 18, I think. Okay, don't quote me on that. That's, um, I know that Pfizer has just submitted data on 12 to 16. And, um, and it, it's likely that, and they, again, how does it happen? Well, they do a trial. Um, sometimes they don't require, no, you know what, I'm not gonna go into that. So that's like regulatory talk, we don't go into that. Um, and and uh, in, in response to this question, I actually looked, if you're interested, there's a, uh, there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov and you can go on and you can search for any vaccine um, or any drug or any, anything being tested in people um, and see what kind of studies are enrolling and whatever. And I, I did see a study from Moderna six, I think I wrote it down here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Moderna has a phase three trial, six months to 12 years that's recruiting um, and um, yeah, and then and then um, Pfizer um, has a trial in pregnant women and kids greater than twelve years old. But then the twelve years uh, the the twelve year old one, I think the twelve to sixteen, I think has the data has been submitted. So we'll have data on the six months to twelve years. Hopefully, not not too long from the Moderna. All right, I'm going to add a little twist to this, and you know. Uh, hopefully nobody in our community, I don't think anybody will get peaked or whatever, but based on even, this is about going back to shul, but even in the last few days, I found out, you know, like one shul wanted to start, they were going to mandate that you had to be vaccinated to come back, but, uh, you know, but apparently that got some pushback. So considering the, and I, you know, at once, you know, considering the fact that at, let's say a normal shul, let's say the majority of people are going to be vaccinated, but there, there will be people there or might be people there that are not vaccinated. You know, and then you have your two part question for people who are vaccinated. You know, I don't know if it's the same answer for people who are vaccinated, people who are not vaccinated when, you know, and considering that there's no video, you know, in our show, there's no video alternative. It's either you're there in the building or, you know, although some of them have an indoor outdoor situation, when and how safe is it to go back to shul in a somewhat, you know, normal way? All right. So let me just. Number one, if people are choosing not to be vaccinated and are going to shul, they are putting the rest of the shul at risk, period. Okay, they just need to understand that. Um, it's not as great a risk as it would have been if other people were not vaccinated. Uh, but remember, we're talking 95% efficacy uh, for um, the mRNAs, 85% for the, um, uh, the J and J, something like that. Novavax is up around, but the point is it's not 100%. So this is a really tough question. We're wrestling it with wrestling with this in our show, whether we can mandate vax. I don't know. I don't know what. I mean, I think it's smart to say, look it. If you want to come to Publix, a indoor public space. You need to be vaccinated, okay? If that's what you want, you need to be vaccinated. If you are going to allow, if you're not gonna ask that question, then at the very least, you're going to have to say, everyone needs to be masked. Just gotta do it. Protect the people who are unvaccinated protect the people who are vaccinated, but still might be part of the 5% that could get disease. I mean, CDC just came out and said, you know, there are people who have break, well, that's all a different question, but, but they're, 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 you just need to, you just need to, um, 
I think, you know, if you're gonna have everybody, you need to, you need to mask them. Okay. Um, this Not is necessarily right. on the BEMA. You know, if you're, if you're laning, if you're up on the BEMA, you know, there, if there's some distance, you know, the person who's doing it can be unmasked. You don't have to do that. But, you know, the people in the congregation just to be safe, that's my recommendation. Would, would there be differences of opinion? Probably. What's right and what's wrong? I don't know. It's, 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 it's really a question of how much risk are you willing to tolerate inside your congregation? Okay. Um, this is just, I'm reading word for word somebody's question here. I was surprised to hear uh, that some sources are saying that the vaccines are only effective for six months. Do you, does Dr. Schrager believe that this is true? How will the potential for vaccines losing their effectiveness, effectiveness influence herd immunity? Okay, so whoever read that, or whoever, if somebody read that statement somewhere, then the person who put that statement is dead wrong. Okay, they may have, maybe, I don't know where, where the misinterpretation came. What Pfizer just showed was after six months, their, va their vaccine was 90% efficacious. Okay, it wasn't non-efficacious. Now there's a little bit of a drop off from 95% after, you know, you know from, from at the end of the, the trial. But that's pretty darn good. That's still better than virtually every vaccine for every other vac disease we have out there. So no, these vaccines are not non-efficacious after six months. No, no, no. They are efficacious. How long they'll stay efficacious is still a question and we have to study them. In terms of herd immunity, the longer the longer you stay protected, the better it is. But the thing about herd immunity and the reason that it's important for everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible is that you don't want smoldering infection. You know, you want to put this thing out. And herd immunity is governed by this equation with this R naught, this was the exponent we talked about it the last time, that you know how many people can one infected person infect if the other people around them are susceptible. So you get an R naught of one, it's perpetuating, self-perpetuating. You get an R naught of two, you've got a, a, an outbreak, a pan, an epidemic, even a pandemic, an R naught of three, and then you really got a forest fire. You know, you take your R naught down to 0 0.5. If everyone around you is, inf is vaccinated, then that very steep curve that you saw in those really bad times when we were accelerating is going to be just as steep on the downside. And that's what we want. Okay. But that's why everybody needs to do their part and get vaccinated, get a really good herd immunity going. So you trap the virus, you stomp it out. You don't allow it to smolder in certain populations. And the sooner we do that, the better, the, the sooner we're really going to be in a, in a, in a more normal situation in, in, in this country. We got six more questions. Is it possible that COVID-19 will eventually go away completely like the Spanish, like with the Spanish flu, or will it always be with us like the seasonal, like a seasonal flu? Yeah, so you know, be, making comparisons to flu is a little bit um, fraught. Flu is a different animal, and that is an entirely different lecture. Okay, it's 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 really flu is different. And by the way, the H one N one that we have now circulating, we have H one N one and H three N two in your in your quadrivalent seasonal, right? You have the H one N one, H three N two, and you have the two B strains. That H one N one is a direct lineage back to the Spanish flu uh, uh, virus. So it really hasn't completely gone away. It's just that we've all become protected against it, okay? Um, we all have a degree of, it's a very complicated, the H1N1 is bizarre and I'm not even gonna get into it. It's a fascinating story. Um, will this completely go away? Probably not. And 
Uh, one reason is because there's still going to be communities that won't that that won't adopt appropriate vaccination uh, uh, behaviors, and and that will smolder, and it'll flare here and flare here and flare here. But it, you know, it's clearly it, it shouldn't be nearly as bad anymore because the vast majority of Americans and and hopefully worldwide will become infected, will become vaccinated. The other thing about it is that remember that coronavirus infects animals. In fact, it came from animals. We're not vaccinating every bat out there. Um, and this virus is likely to keep spreading in, in bats and other animals. And at some point in the future, it could flare again because in these wet markets in China, if they're allowed to come back or somewhere else, you know, that you have a, a, an animal reservoir that can continue to reinfect humans who are susceptible. And because of that, just like influenza, um, no, it won't go away. Okay. Um, this kid I tutor keeps dreaming. He's, he hasn't had like a normal day of high school and he keeps wanting to, because he started as a freshman, I think, and then it hit um, practice. So he keeps dreaming of this, I, he's like, he said to me, can you imagine a day when everybody, you know, when everything is back, it's going to be so awesome. So when do you think is things will be normal? What do you think the first normal day will be? Do you, you know, do you think we'll be back to normal in January? Yeah, obviously I can't put a specific date on this. Um, you know, we're going to move toward normalcy. We're already moving toward normalcy. You know, we just talked about vaccinated folks saying, you know what, we can do some nice to do things and not just need to do things in public now. Maybe with some modifications, I think one of the questions is what, what does normal look like now? You know, I mentioned that I would give very serious consideration of wearing masks on flights, particularly longer distance flights, except to eat, maybe to sleep. But, you know, again, the more you, protect yourself, protect others. It's not a bad idea when you're in these, in these cans, you know, when everybody's breathing the same air. Yes, that's recirculated and HEPA filtered and all that. But, you know, the, the surface, anyway. And by the way, if it's not just for COVID, it's for influenza, it's for rhinovirus, it's for, you know, you know these other things that make me sick every time I go to Israel. <laughs> it's really <laughs> annoying. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, what is it? But but by next January, I think we're going to be, we're going to be, I, I can't imagine that we won't be really functioning as a, as a, a more regular society as we did before. Um, I think theaters will be open, whether you need to wear masks to go to theater, I don't know, but that's okay. Movie theaters. Maybe it becomes a personal choice. You wear a mask, you don't. Um, they'll be open. Restaurants, um, bars. So it's already happening. It might be a little premature in certain areas. But yeah, by next January, we should be good to go. I, hopefully before then. I mean, you know, Biden is talking about July 4th. Um, and and uh, we're, we're, we're really moving fast now with the vaccinations, which is really good. Um, I'm just going to address a question from the um, from the chat that's about accessing this recording afterwards. So I'm going to send this out to this this recording. I'll say it'll be on YouTube, and I'll send it out to the same people that I sent. However, you got the invitation, so I'm going to send it to West Orange Schools and you know the the same resources. I'll send the recording, um, so you'll be able to um, access it. Um, so this, some of these are almost repetitious, but they were listed and we wrote them, and so. I'm going to okay. go with it. How safe is it to go sh to shul, uh, back to shul without masks? Well, I, yeah, I think we addressed that. You know, if you're vaccinated, um, if, if everyone's vaccinated, it's really safe. Um, it, I mean, the, the risk goes way down. Yeah. If, if you're going to allow both, the risk goes up somewhat. Uh, we, I think we dealt with that. Okay, cool. So, yeah, depending on... on uh, the, the shul's protocol. All right. Do you think it's, uh, uh, see, what about for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, where you're going to have, then you got a lot of people and all kinds, and, and, and you, and you got people, whatever protocols, 
maybe there's a question more addressing like to ask to, for you to address the rabbis, you know, what kind of, you know, when, when you have all kinds of people coming in, um, if it was you for, if you were, the, if you were, you know, in the, on the board in a shul um, and telling the rabbi what to do for Rosh Hashanah or making the rules for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, what would, what would you, what would you say? All right, I'm going to stick my neck out. Um, I would say that if we're not going to require proof of vaccination, then people who are sitting in shul should wear masks. Cool. Period. Simple one. I would also do everything I could to improve the ventilations in shuls and every place else. I know how crowded shuls can get in the Chagim. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, so, yeah. Good. It's a good idea. I didn't even think of the ventilation. Our district's ventilation so much. is key. Open the windows, have fans going, get an air exchange somehow, okay? Forget the air air conditioner. Pop those windows open. Put exhaust fans. You know, when I was a kid, I used to sleep with an exhaust fan in my window. You know, everybody blows the air in. If you turn around and blow it out and keep a window open on the other side of your room, you get this amazing cross breeze, and you move air out. You know, and if if there were, you know, if I were running a show, if I were running a theater, my first. I would, I would, I would get the funds to consult with people, you know, HVAC people, people who could help me devise ways of getting free, better, fresh airflow, which, by the way, will not just happen help us with coronavirus. It'll help help us with influenza. It will help us with all, you know, in in the in the in, with other things, uh, other other particularly viral diseases. Uh, so yeah, um, that, you know, there's, there's, I think that's a really neglected area um, that could really use some attention and, 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 and investment uh, in, 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 of, of, of shul resources. Cool, awesome. Um, we had a chat question. Are we getting close to the level where everyone who wants to be vaccinated is? What percentage of people do we think are not going to choose to get vaccinated? So I think the first answer is yes. I mean, right now they're talking about a surplus of vaccines in this country, which, you know, we better help out India because India is in a world of hurt right now. Um, uh, in terms of what percentage, I don't know. Um, I don't know. You know, you can, you'll have to look at polls, different you know, breakdowns, you know, this gets political. I don't want to get political, um, you know, but I hope people, I hope people on this call can, can help combat, can help confront misinformation around vaccines. Um, and, you know, if you, if it's a mitzvah, if you can convince people you know who might be reluctant to be vaccinated um, to, to actually take the vaccine. And by the way, if, 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 that's, if there's a situation and somebody wants to have like a personal discussion about that, Zalman, give him my number and I'm happy to talk to him. Okay, thank you. Because I'm seeing one, I'm, I got a chat going on here, a direct, you know, personal one with somebody that's talking about like our shul and, um, and this guy is a super smart science guy who totally agrees about the ventilation. And like I said, I do too. That's a genius idea. That's what we spent millions of dollars on in my district. And it's, it's so, it makes me feel much better. Okay. Um, is, the, is there a difference in the safety of kids by age against, safe, against COVID? Does it work proportionally? The younger you are, the safer you are. I know it's not for sure known, but is it? I don't cool? know. I don't, I don't even know if that study has been done. Um, it might have been. I can't say I follow the literature, particularly pediatric literature, that closely. Um, you know, I, I think speak, speak, speaking generally, um, kids have better outcomes um, than, than, older, than older people. Um, but, I, but because there are kids who don't have good outcomes, um, I wouldn't want to risk it with my kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, last one that's from, from the list. Um, and it might be the last one because I don't see, there's nothing else in chat. Um, 
How safe are um, outdoor minyanim? Wonderfully safe. I would say enjoy it. Man, I think this would be the great, like I talk about a silver lining. Um, <laughs> that, that you can actually have minyanim outdoors. You know, I, you know, it'd be great if the shul's just invested in like tents with open sides. You can enjoy the summer, you can enjoy the spring, you can enjoy the fall. People go with coats, it's, it's okay. Um, and you're, you know, it's just nice. Uh, but yes, the, you know, if th this is f f the conceptually, conceptually from an epidemiological perspective, it's really not wrong to think that this is an indoor virus. This is an indoor disease. And the more you're outdoors, the more ventilation you have, the more free flow of air, the, the, the less your chance of acquiring this virus, even, even if you're not vaccinated. I mean, that's, you know, but yeah, I'll go for it. Outdoor minyana, great idea. Do it. Okay. Cool. Um, and then that's, that's all of our questions. So I, I figure maybe we'll leave 15 or 20 seconds, see if anybody, you know, wants to just shout out any questions. And then if not, if you have any closing remarks that you want to say, you know, um, but, uh, but before that, but um, thank you so much. I mean, this has been phenomenal. And we got really nice comments already in the, um, in the what's it called in the chat and somebody taught, that's gonna share it um, out to the, the, I think the Federation it was. Um, uh, yeah, the Jewish Federation, this person works for the Jewish Federation is gonna share it out to them. So that's fantastic. Um, but so, um, so is it, does anybody have any questions that they wanna just call out? All right, so Luke, do you have any closing closing things? You, you know, you had to answer questions. You have anything you want to say? You know, no, I, I just want to thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Zalman, for organizing this. Thank your community for your great questions, for your interests, for your concerns. Um, and um, you know, it's just it's just a good feeling to think we're all we're all just pulling together and getting through this. And there really is a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm actually feeling like I'm standing a bit in the light right now. Um, life is returning, returning toward normal, whatever normal means. Um, and it's communities like yours that take this seriously, that ask great questions, that get vaccinated and, and, um, and reach out to, you know, try to get as much information as, as, as you can get from, you know, not just me, obviously, but, but from a lot of people who know a lot more than I do, um, that, um, you know, we'll really, we'll really get through this. So thank you all. Thanks for your attention and great questions. And, um, you know, wish you all a great, a great spring and summer. Thank you so much, Luke. That was phenomenal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay. And Bezos.